Hello friends and welcome to my channel. Today we're going to learn about the humerus. The humerus. The humerus is the bone of the arm. It is the longest bone of the upper limb. It articulates with the glenoid cavity of the scapula to form the shoulder joint. This is the humerus. Now let's look at its features. It has an upper end, a lower end and a shaft. Now let's learn about the upper end. The head of the humerus is directed backwards, upwards and medially that is towards the body. It articulates with the glenoid cavity of the scapula to form the shoulder joint. The head forms about one third of a sphere and is much larger than the glenoid cavity. The line separating the head from the rest of the upper end is called the anatomical neck. This is the anatomical neck. The lesser tubercle is an elevation on the anterior aspect of the upper end. This is a lesser tubercle. The greater tubercle is an elevation that forms the lateral part of the upper end. Its posterior aspect is marked by three impressions, the upper, middle and the lower. The intertubercular sulcus or the bicipital groove separates the lesser tubercle from the greater tubercle. The sulcus has medial and lateral lips that represent the downward prolongations of the lesser tubercle and the greater tubercle. The narrow line separating the upper end of the humerus from the shaft is called the surgical neck. This is the surgical neck while this is the anatomical neck. Now let us learn about the shaft. This is the shaft. It is rounded in the upper half here and triangular in the lower half. It has three borders and three surfaces. This is the anterior border. This is the medial border. And this is the lateral border. There are three surfaces. The anteromedial surface, the anterolateral surface, and the posterior surface. Now let's learn about the borders. The upper one third of the anterior border forms the lateral lip of the intertubercular sulcus. The middle one third forms the anterior margin of the deltoid tuberosity. The lower half of the anterior border is smooth and rounded. The lateral border is prominent only at the lower end where it forms the lateral supracondylar ridge. In the upper part, it is barely traceable up to the posterior surface of the greater tubercle. In the middle part, it is interrupted by the radial or the spiral groove. Now let's move on to the medial border. This is the medial border. The upper part of the medial border forms the medial lip of the intertubercular sulcus. About its middle, it presents a rough strip. It is continuous below with the medial supracondylar ridge. Now let's learn about the surfaces. The anterolateral surface lies between the anterior border and the lateral border. The upper half of the surface is covered by the deltoid. A little above the middle, it is marked by the V-shaped deltoid tuberosity. Behind the deltoid tuberosity, the radial groove runs downwards and forwards. This is the radial groove. It runs downwards and forwards. The anteromedial surface lies between the anterior border and the medial border. Its upper one third forms the floor of the intertubercular sulcus. The posterior surface lies between 
the lateral border and the medial border. Its upper part is marked by an oblique ridge. The middle one third is crossed by the radial groove. Now let's learn about the lower end of the humerus. The lower end forms the condyle which is expanded from side to side and has articular and non-articular parts. The articular parts include the capitulum and the trochlea. The capitulum is a rounded projection that articulates with the head of the radius. The trochlea is a pulley shaped surface. It articulates with the trochlea notch of the ulna. The medial edge of the ulna projects 6 mm more down than the lateral edge. This results in the formation of the carrying angle. The non-articular parts include the medial epicondyle, the lateral epicondyle, the medial supracondylar ridge, the lateral supracondylar ridge, the coronoid fossa, the radial fossa and the olecranon fossa. The medial epicondyle is a prominent bony projection seen on the medial side of the lower end. It is subcutaneous and easily felt on the medial side of the elbow. Now subcutaneous means it can be easily felt below the skin. The lateral epicondyle is smaller than the medial epicondyle. Its anterolateral part has a muscular impression. The sharp lateral margin just above the lateral epicondyle is called the lateral supracondylar ridge. The sharp medial margin just above the medial epicondyle is called the medial supracondylar ridge. The coronoid fossa is a depression seen just above the anterior aspect of the trochlea. It accommodates the coronoid process of the ulna when the elbow is flexed. The radial fossa is a depression seen just above the capitulum on its anterior aspect. It accommodates the head of the radius when the elbow is flexed. The olecranon fossa is seen on the posterior aspect just above the trochlea. It accommodates the olecranon process of the ulna when the elbow is extended. Now how do we determine the side of this humerus? There are basically three points. The upper end is rounded to form the head. The lower end is expanded from side to side. The head is directed medially that is towards the body, upwards and backwards. A large fossa is seen in the lower end that faces posteriorly and this fossa is called the olecranon fossa. Therefore, we come to the conclusion that this humerus is of the right side. Now let's learn about the attachments of muscles on the humerus. Now before I start with the attachments, please note that the blue color indicates the insertion of muscles and the red color indicates the origin of muscles. The green color indicates the attachments of joint capsules and ligaments. Now looking at the upper end of the humerus, the supraspinatus is inserted into the uppermost impression on the greater tubercle of the humerus that is right here. The infraspinatus is inserted into the middle impression of the greater tubercle and the teres minor is inserted into the lower impression of the greater tubercle. This diagram shows the posterior aspect of the scapula and the humerus. The supraspinatus is inserted into the uppermost impression or the greater tubercle of the humerus. The infraspinatus is inserted into the middle impression of the greater tubercle of the humerus and the teres minor is inserted into the lowermost impression of the greater tubercle of the humerus. On the lesser tubercle, the multipennate subscapularis muscle is inserted. This diagram shows the anterior aspect of the body 
the subscapularis muscle is inserted on the lesser tubercle of the humerus. The supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor and the subscapularis are together called the sits muscles and they form the muscles of the rotator cuff. Now looking at the intertubercular sulcus or the bicipital groove, the floor of the groove gives insertion to the latissimus dorsi that you see right here. The medial lip gives insertion to the teres major muscle while the lateral lip of the intertubercular sulcus provides insertion to the pectoralis major. In order to make it easier, we can remember a lady between two majors. The lady is the latissimus dorsi and the two majors are the pectoralis major and the teres major. Moving to the borders, the medial border gives insertion to the coracobrachialis at its middle. This is the coracobrachialis muscle. It is inserted on the middle of the medial border of the humerus. Moving on to the surfaces, the lower half of the anteromedial and anterolateral surfaces gives origin to the brachialis muscle. This is the brachialis muscle. It originates from the lower half of the anteromedial and anterolateral surfaces of the humerus. On the anterolateral aspect of the humerus, there is the presence of a deltoid tuberosity which gives insertion to the deltoid. This is the deltoid muscle. It is inserted on the anterolateral aspect of the humerus on the deltoid tuberosity. The posterior surface gives origin to the lateral head of the triceps brachii from the oblique ridge above the radial groove. This is the lateral head of the triceps brachii. It originates from the oblique ridge above the radial groove on the posterior surface of the humerus. The medial head of the triceps brachii originates from the posterior surface below the radial groove. This is the medial head of the triceps brachii. It originates from the posterior surface of the humerus below the radial groove. Now looking at the lower end of the humerus, the brachioradialis originates from the upper two-thirds of the lateral supracondylar ridge that is right here. This is the brachioradialis muscle. It originates from the upper two-thirds of the lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus. The extensor carpi radialis longus originates from the lower one-third of the lateral supracondylar ridge right here. This is the extensor carpi radialis longus. It originates from the lower one-third of the lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus. The humeral head of the pronated teres originates from the lower one-third of the medial supracondylar ridge. This is the humeral head of the pronated teres. It originates from the lower one-third of the medial supracondylar ridge. The superficial flexor muscles of the forearm arise by a common origin from the anterior aspect of the medial epicondyle. This is called the common flexor origin. The superficial extensor muscles of the forearm and supinator have a common origin from the lateral epicondyle. This is called the common extensor origin. The anconius originates from the posterior surface of the lateral epicondyle. This is the anconius. It originates from the posterior surface of the lateral epicondyle. So let's learn about the attachments of capsules on the humerus. The capsular ligament of the shoulder joint is attached to the anatomical head of the humerus except for its medial part where it lies a little below it and includes a small part of the shaft. It is also limited in its upper end where it provides a passage for the biceps brachii tendon to pass through that is near the intertubercular sulcus. The capsular ligament of the elbow joint is attached to the lower end along a line that reaches the upper ends of the coronoid fossa and the radial fossa anteriorly and the olecranon fossa posteriorly so that these fossae 
lie within the joint cavity. The contents of the intertubercular sulcus or the bicipital groove are the tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii and the ascending branch of the anterior circumflex humeral artery. Three nerves are directly related to the humerus and are therefore liable to injury. The axillary nerve at the surgical head of the humerus, the radial nerve at the radial groove and the ulnar nerve behind the medial epicondyle. I hope you found this video helpful. If you like my video, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you for watching.